This is Join Us in France, episode 324. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and today I bring you a conversation with Susan Walking about bread in France and why bread is such an important piece of French culture and life. We talk a little bit about the history of bread, and we agree on many things, including what's up with the obsession with finding the best baguette in France. <sighs> And something I don't think I mentioned in the episode, and I should have, if you don't live close to a great bakery, you can buy several loaves, slice them in a way that they'll fit in your toaster, and put them in a bag to freeze them. When you need some bread, take it out of the freezer, pop the slices into the toaster, baguette freezes really well and will taste fabulous that way. If you like what we do here at Join Us in France, consider supporting us by going to patreon.com forward slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, join us, no spaces or dashes, and by visiting joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique to check out my cookbook, Join Us at the Table, and my Paris tours. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash the numeral 324, where you can see a recap of what we've discussed, as well as link to relevant resources. And please follow Addicted to France on Instagram to see bread photos. I'll post them this week. The best way to stay in touch with me and with the podcast is to sign up for the newsletter at joinusinfrance.com for slash newsletter. And I plan on sending out a new newsletter next week. <laughs> Bonjour, Susan, and welcome to join us in France. Hi, Annie. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, talk to you, and um, this should be a fun little session. Yeah, so today we want to talk about bread in France. <laughs> That's such a big subject, but let's. Uh, you have a big interest of bread from your family origins and because you like to cook and bake? Uh, yes, and because there's very particular traditions in France about bread, so it's very interesting that French bread is well known to be different to everywhere else, and there are lots of reasons for that. So I became intrigued and... Um, uh, I've, you know, I've talked to my local boulanger and um, lots of people about it. And of course, I eat bread every day, just oh. like a French person does. <laughs> yes, so do I. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Uh, and yeah. you are from Australia originally. Yes. And you have been living in France for a few years, I take it. Uh, nearly 15 years now. Oh, wow. And your yeah. French is good? Uh, technically, I'm B1, so oh. it's good enough to get me citizenship, yeah. um, but not strictly speaking fluent. So I always refer to it as functional. <laughs> um, so, yes, I mean, I, you know, I still study French all the time. Right, um, right. To improve my French. So you have a lovely blog called Days on the Clés, et la Clés is a part of France that we really haven't talked about on the podcast very much. It's um, a little bit north of Poitiers. Well, yeah, it's by Tours, right? Yes. it's um, Our de departmental town, our, our prefectural town is Tours. So that's where we do all our admin. Um, but we're exactly the same dif distance to Poitiers. But Poitiers culturally is a bit different as well. So we're part of the Touraine, Whereas Poitiers is, well, it's Poitevin. Poitevin, yes. Um, um, so, um, yeah, you do notice when you cross from one to the other the architectural style changes and things like that. Yeah, a lovely part of France that it is. we haven't mm. really talked about very much on the podcast. But who knows, since you have this lovely blog that has some 
I, I don't know. I, I just opened it up today and you have a recipe for Blanquette de Vaux, which is right up my alley. Mm. Yep, <laughs> and so that's true. <laughs> your interests are similar to mine. And I like that uh, you put in a lot of pictures of, of the, mm. all the different steps and all that. So I recommend people visit your blog and I will put a, uh, a, long, a link for it on the show notes so that uh, if you don't know how to uh, find it, you can find it there. Okay. That would so, be great. Let's talk about French bread. Why don't we? Bread is absolutely a staple. Everybody eats it. Um, and, and at every meal, you know, that, that sort of a stereotype is absolutely true. And here in the middle of France, um, we're part of the largest wheat producing area in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. So I'm surrounded by wheat fields all the time. Mm -hmm. This is where the flour for French bread comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and French people take bread very seriously. Um, so in France, there are no additives allowed. Uh, for instance, in a lot of countries, it's the law that you add nutritional supplements and you are allowed to add uh, bread improvers and yeah. other ingredients. And that's just not allowed in France. Right. Um, so not even uh, extra gluten, which is a typical trick that they do in the U.S. to mm. to rise the bread higher yep. and faster. Yep. They just yep. add a little bit of gluten. Not yep. in France. Mm -hmm. And also beat it really heavily so that it's beaten air like egg white, um, like a meringue that's making the bread rise rather than giving the bread time to rise just using the action yep. of the yeast. So the yeast is modifying the flour and um, creating the rise. So French bread takes time to make, which your average supermarket um, loaf of sliced bread does not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it does have yeast in it, but it's basically just a flavouring agent. It's a seasoning, whereas French bread, you couldn't make it without yeast. Yeah, um, well, that, that may be a bit of an exaggeration. I mean, it wouldn't rise without the... Even if you beat it to death, it wouldn't rise <laughs> enough. Like, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, bread is taken very, very seriously in France, and we eat it a lot, that's for sure. And it has been that way for a very long time. Yes, I mean, since the Middle Ages. And even when people were not in a position where they had their own ovens... There's a long tradition of having public ovens or community ovens where you brought your dough and that was baked um, by the community um, baker yeah. who was employed by the local lord. Um, so all around France you'll see places called Four Banal um, and that's the community bread oven. Yeah, and it was a big deal because that's one of the ways that the lord kept... I was going to say tabs, but it's not tabs. It's kept uh, power over yes. his people is because yes. having an oven at home was not practical because ovens are dangerous. They need yep. to be hot enough. It would burn mm. down your house. Yes. So it was just smarter to have one place where they knew what they were doing. <laughs> but that yes. person answered to the Lord. And to be able yes. to use the four banal, you had to pay your taxes. Yep, that's uh, right. Otherwise, you were out on your own. And yep. that was a big, big problem. That's one of the reasons why it was always better for peasants to associate themselves with a lord than to, mm. say, live in a forest, you know, or yep. something like that by themselves. Yes. Yep. Yeah, no, that's very true. And that system only really broke down um, with the revolution because it was really embedded in the feudal system, yep. um, the, the system of Forbanol. And so once, once the revolution um, smashed the system, commercial bakeries sprang up everywhere in, in urban locations. But, of course, if you lived somewhere rural, you then had to actually build an oven for yourself. So... It, certainly around here in the Loire Valley, you see um, lots of farmhouses will have a bread oven somewhere in the farmyard. Mm -hmm. And today, they're often converted to pizza ovens. <laughs> um, 
because, you know, it's exactly the same technique, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it works. Pizza is bread. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things um, that I uh, discovered um, was the reason for uh, bakery. Bakeries in French is, is boulangerie. And uh, the reason for that is that the long loaves that we all think of as quintessentially French these days, like baguette or standard pain, they're actually relatively modern. Mm -hmm. And the original French loaf is round and called boule. Yeah. So hence you get boulangerie. Yeah. Uh, Mm, I, I, I thought that was a fascinating little piece of technology when I discovered it. I was thrilled. I thought of it, but it's true. It's, it's, mm. it's in boule de pain or in miche de pain. And mm. uh, yeah, it's boulangerie. Yeah. yeah. So miche kind of just means loaf. And um, in French, you know, you can use it as a slang term for, for buttocks. Um, <laughs> just like in, in American English, you can use buns. Yes. In, Buttocks. <laughs> yes, and and the baguette is a much more recent. Very recent. Because baguettes um, are hard to produce, really. Well, they are and they aren't. Um, like a lot of these things, it was a technological change that drove a change in what bread was appearing in the boulangerie. So baguettes don't appear until the early 20th century. And... What was happening was that in Vienna, uh, they had perfected a technique of injecting steam into the oven so you could make these very crunchy loaves. Yeah. And uh, once that had been perfected, the, the ovens arrived in France and so people started making these Viennese-style breads. But then also um, you got legislation which forbade uh, bakers to start work before 4 a.m., uh, which meant that they really needed a small loaf that was going to rise quickly enough mm. to serve at 6.30 in the morning when they actually opened their doors. Mm -hmm. So most bakers these days, um, they begin work at 4.30 in the morning and they're proving the baguettes and then the baguettes don't take very long to cook and then there's a whole pile of baguettes available there for the customers right. um, when they start rolling in from 6.30. Yep. And most bakers will, will bake multiple times through the day oh, as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. By, by now, it's impossible to just produce everything. When I was a child growing up in France, that's how it was. The baker mm. would just show up and make as many loaves as uh, they would sell throughout the day. Mm. Nobody does it that way anymore. You know, bakers are on staff all day. Even in, in a village like mine, the baker is there pretty much most of the day. I mean, I see him riding his bike sometimes, like around four mm. or something. Mm. Yep. <laughs> so so he lets his his employees do some of the work. But mm. um but yeah, they they do they bake several times a day now. Yep. Yeah. They do. Um, and it's very, in, in villages like um, you and I live, it, it's a husband and wife team very often. Yeah. Um, so one of them will be the baker, one of them will be front of house. Yeah. There will be two or three employees and an, at least one apprentice, maybe more. Yeah. And yeah, they, they work all day until about, they probably quit about three o'clock, although the the um, bakery will be open until 7.30 in the evening. Yeah, but usually. Or they, what? I don't know about your village, but in mine, if they're out of bread, they close. Mm. <laughs> I don't recall that ever happening here, but I know that it does happen. Yeah, oh, it's, um, it happens but, here. It happened <laughs> um, more with it, the previous baker. He was more we, stingy. He didn't want to have any waste. Yeah. So no, I, I don't blame him. Yeah. So the guy today, he's he run he never runs out pretty much, and sometimes yeah. he has big bags of bread of hard bread that he puts yeah. outside for whoever to take for their yeah. chickens and, or whatever. Yeah, uh, uh, chickens and rabbits. Yes. Yeah. So I I see that here as well. Yeah. So yeah, I think the bakers themselves um, stop work at about three. 
but th- they live the the baker and his wife live above the bakery mm-hmm. so um if if you walk in they have a bell and all that happens is that sophie comes downstairs from whatever she's been doing you know the ironing or something probably mm-hmm. uh, and and serves you you know because there's only intermittent um customers in in the in the afternoon yeah and I, I think that's pretty typical for villagers. Yeah, for villagers, that's how it works. Now, in a bigger city, they have whole staff and whatever, mm. you know. Yes. And so there's always yep. people behind the counter all day long. But in villages, mm, they're yep. multitasking. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And and I think that that is a lot of... Uh, being an apprentice baker is the most popular um, apprenticeship to take up. Uh, these days in France, but um, apprentices aren't necessarily aiming to become independent bakers with their own shop. What they actually want these days more often is to become salaried workers in a big bakery. So the supermarkets all have big-ish bakeries. It's It's a nice, safe way of earning your income without all the costs of running a business yeah. and all the headache of, yeah. of running a business and the administration and what have you. And so what we're finding is that uh, bakers, um, if, you know, once they get old enough to retire, they're struggling to sell their businesses mm. um, and young bakers uh, are more reluctant to take up these vacated bakeries. Yeah. Um, and very often, I mean, the problem partly is that these places have been run by the same person for decades, and so all the equipment is outdated. So it's not a matter of just buying the business and walking in and, and hey, presto, you're an up-and-running bakery. New young bakers walk into these places and go, oh, my God, I can't believe they've got one of those. Yeah. Um, and and want to uh, completely refurbish, right? And so it's a huge investment, and it's expensive, and a big risk. Yeah, yeah. The the the, the equipment is extremely expensive. Yes. A modern uh, bakery oven will, you know, it's it's the price of a modest house. <laughs> Just yep, for the oven, could be. Yes. you know, it's 150 yeah, yeah. grand more or less yep. for yes. a mm. for a modern, you know, piece of equipment, and yep. <laughs> that's a lot to come up with, especially when you're selling stuff that sells for a euro, a euro twenty, euro the, thirty, maybe. Yeah, the markup for for baked goods is unbelievably small. Yeah, you know, it's it's a few percent. Yeah. So the the raw materials cost you 10% of the value of the product. The salaries will be nearly a quarter of the product. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've got admin and overheads and, and what have yeah, you. Taxes, so, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, you're lucky if you're making 5 or 10 cents um, on, uh, on a unit. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a difficult business, and that's why I don't know about you, but I go to my bakery a lot, and yeah. they've taken to um, uh, around holidays. They make specialty items yeah. that you can order, so they they hand you a an order sheet, and you, like for Christmas, we ordered a bunch of stuff from them, yeah. and they they sell a lot more at that point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because instead of walking out having paid, you know, three euro, three and a half euros, I walk out with fifty euros worth of stuff. Yeah, and that's not always the size of a sale for a baker. That's usually rarely the size of a sale for a baker. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, I, um, our local baker does the same. So you get galette de roi for um, January. Um, you'll get les bûches, uh, les bûchettes pat- at Christmas time. De Pâques for Easter. Yeah. And oh, and they have uh, my baker has the best little Easter uh, molded chocolates. Mm. Oh, it was so. I remember this because it was the beginning of the confinement. So mm. going out to the bakery was like emotionally. I had to, 
you know, yes. like yep. deep breaths, deep breaths. Mm. And but every time I went, I bought several of these baggies of chocolates. They were so good. <laughs> Uh, so did you put on the standard amount of weight in France? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Which I'm, was like two and a half kilos Yeah, I, I might be a little bit more than that, but uh, <laughs> hopefully it'll go away eventually. I don't know. I'm starting to get quite concerned. <laughs> Anyway, all right. Sorry, we 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 we're chatting and uh, getting away from um, from mm, breads sorry. from breads. Mm. Um, yeah. So anyway, so we were talking about the the problem of the succession once a baker retires, and so more and more around here, um, where you have a very aging population, um, I'm seeing empty bakeries. But the solution that that um, municipalities are coming up with, because they have to come up with a solution, it's it's a French person's right to have access to fresh bread. It's it's enshrined in law. So um, they are um, installing baguette vending machines. Yes. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, you know, they're you know, they're bright red or bright yellow, and they stand in front of the the town hall. Um, they're clearly modern, um, and some people, you know, just don't like them from that point of view. But actually, they're performing a really important service. Yeah. So a local bakery from the next village along is contracted to stock the right. vending machine, and so three times a day, fresh baguettes um, will go into the machine, and you pay maybe five cents, maybe ten cents more for the baguette. Uh, right. The one the, the one in the village near us that my local bakery supplies, I think you pay five cents more for. Um, and it's exactly the same bread as if you yeah. went, you know, across to the next village and bought it fr directly from the baker. Yeah, so, so this is something that's not so common where I live, but yeah. that's probably because, I mean, we're... This is Airbus town, and mm. there are mm. plenty of young families yep. around. So mm. it's not the same. The eco economics are not the same. Yep. Yep. Uh, I rarely see a bread vending machine unless I go like to the Lariège or, you know, mm. more boonies type of places. Yep. Um, yeah. No, well, I mean, in, in this area, my particular village has... Uh, all the shops you would need, but it's actually rather unusual for a village in this area. And so we have good a good population of incomers, but they still don't outstrip the number of deaths per year. You know, the population is so old mm. that that um, deaths outstrip births, certainly, by mm. about 40 to 1. Oh, wow, um, yeah. So our population, our total population, is very slowly declining. But that um, must mean that it's inexpensive to buy property yes, where you are. So, so we're quite, a, yeah, we're quite an attractive proposition. Right. Um, it's a nice village. There are a lot of incomers who fit in very well. Everybody seems well integrated. Um, and by incomers, I don't necessarily mean expats like me, but people from other French regions. So this village is very attractive to retired French professionals, uh, people in the arts, that sort of thing. Yeah. So actually culturally and sort of um, in terms of village activities, yeah. um, there, there's, there can be a, quite a lot going on. There's a lot of really interesting people live here. <laughs> very um, good. So I'm, I mentioned to you earlier that I'm absolutely surrounded by wheat fields, and that's very true. It's it's um, it's very agricultural here, um, and the the single biggest crop grown here is wheat um, because it's so important. Um, and one of the reasons that French bread is different is because French uh, wheat is a spring re a spring wheat, um, meaning that it's sown in autumn. It over matures, uh, it over winters to, to mature in the spring and then it's harvested in June. Mm -hmm. So um, the Loire Valley has pretty much the right, the perfect climate for that sort of wheat. 
it doesn't rain too excessively in the winter, it doesn't get too cold. May is usually fairly warm. Um, there's usually a little bit of rain to help plump up the ears of wheat in in that late stage. Mm -hmm. um, and then June will be dry and that's all good for the harvest. Mm -hmm. um, yes. But of course, uh, a winter wheat is a soft wheat, so it's not very high in protein. Right. Um, and that's one of the things that makes French bread unusual is because, of course, all the advice you will see in your cookbooks and online and what have you will tell you that you have to have bread flour and bread flour is high in protein. Um, and it's not necessarily true. Yeah, it depends on the variety of wheat. Mm. Yes, mm. and where I live, um, I see them sowing... Uh, I have a I have a walking habit, and I walk in uh, around uh, farms, you know, fields that are used by farmers, and yeah. they I think I'm pretty sure that they sow in maybe this time of year. It's like it's we're recording this um, middle of January. I think it might be sown by February and yeah. harvested in early June. Right. Where I am, but it might be for a different use, you know. Yeah, because... here it, it would be too wet. The fields, nobody goes on the fields at this time of year because ah, they're too, too wet, uh, saturated with water, and you'll just bog your machines and yeah. impact the soil. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. it's definitely uh, here, it's definitely sown in the autumn when you can still work the soil. Interesting. And then it just, you know, it just looks like grass for the whole of winter. Mm -hmm. And then uh, by March, you'll see that it's it's growing ears and getting taller. Um, yeah. and, and and by April, May, you'll see that it's very clearly wheat. And, and that, that's about that point you can see whether the farmer is growing wheat or barley as well because yeah. prior to that, it's almost impossible to distinguish between them unless you're a farmer. Yeah. Yes, and this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to make your own baguette in the U.S. Mm. And mm. trust me, I did because I lived in the U.S. for uh, yep. almost two decades. Yep. And it, I tried and I tried and I tried and I couldn't ever get it just right. Yep. And it was because even if I bought uh, wheat from, say, Louisiana, there was this wheat mill in Louisiana that said it was more like French wheat mm. it wasn't quite right uh, I mean well, it was fine it was it was close but it not quite <laughs> yep the other reason and and I'm more and more inclined to think that this is actually quite important is the business of additives so in the US it's the law that you have to have nutritional additives in flour um, and you don't have that in France. Yeah, no. And, and I think it makes a difference to how the flour reacts with the other ingredients mm -hmm. and, and so what your end product ends up being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it, it surprises me that all over France you find this same bread flour that's... Um, but our baker here in the village has... Um, posters that explains that he uses a special kind of wheat from the Gers, which mm -hmm. is a nearby department. Yep. And I th so now they're at the point where they actually kind of uh, do some marketing around the specific area that the wheat comes from because yep. that way they can charge a tiny little bit more because yep. it's, you know, yep. extra special. It's like yep. getting a, uh, une baguette normale or uh, une tradition. Yes. You know? Well, I, I mean, I think that's actually quite an important point too is that um, I always say to people, don't go in and just buy une baguette. You want a tradition um, because that's going to be using the best ingredients, the simplest ingredients, and be made in this extremely traditional way. So it's the, it's the baguette that French people prefer. And uh, even in the um, bread vending machines, in the baguette vending machines, it's the tradition that they put in the vending machine, not mm. your bog standard um, yeah. baguette. 
and it's, so it's obvious that that's what the consumer wants, actually. Yeah, and this, is, this has changed because growing up in France, what we bought was gros pain, un gros mm. pain, which yeah. was, it's a 400 gram mm. uh, bread. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and of course, because I, I grew up in a kind of a blue collar home, you know, that's mm. what everybody around bought, the gros mm. pain. And when I came back from, to France from the U.S., no more gros pain anywhere. I can't find uh, it anywhere. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, the, our baker still makes it. But, you know, oh, yeah? remember, I, I'm surrounded by really old people. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? I'm not to. that old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, the gros pain here has disappeared. It's n not anywhere, which was funny because... Uh, <laughs> I did find a bakery in the U.S. I think it was in Salt Lake City, but I can't remember for sure. And mm. I walk in there, and their sign said, Gros Pain, whatever. And my husband, is, he was laughing. And I'm like, why are you laughing? Well, it says, Gross Pain. Oh, uh, mm. <laughs> hee mm. Yes, yes. <laughs> ha ha, yeah. Mm. Anyway, yeah, so the, 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 there, there's fashion. Not, not a fashion, but there's... Yes, <clears throat> The, yep. the what the consumers want has evolved as well. Yes, yes. I mean, and nowadays, actually, that very crusty um, uh, crust isn't so popular. It's more uh, your Italian style chewier bread that's more popular. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's true. You know, people think these things are immutable, and and that they're um, that in France food never changes but it's you know it evolves all the time e even bread oh um, definitely because if if the baker tries a new recipe which they do sometimes mm. and it doesn't sell well that's mm. the end of that you know yep um mm. so our baker likes to make these um norwegian kind of heavy breads with um with lots of grains inside or whatever we're probably mm. the only ones who buy them yep yeah they, they wouldn't sell well here either no and so mm. uh, once in a while i just order one and they end mm. up costing a lot more money because he puts in a lot yep. of stuff in there that's expensive mm. so yep. i just ask him for one you know for mm. special occasions yeah. but uh yep. but yeah but it's, mm. if it doesn't sell they're not going to keep making it Yep. And the other thing to consider is that actually, even though people do still eat bread every day, consumption of bread is slowly going down. So nowadays, um, the average daily consumption per person is half a baguette. Um, whereas if you went 150 years ago, it would be the equivalent of three baguettes oh, yeah. per person per day. Yeah. Um, and, and there are a number of reasons for that, but, um, you know, it, 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 it's also why the boulangeries are finding it harder and harder, um, you know, yet another reason why they're finding it harder um, to make a living is because they are literally selling less bread. Um, people are eating less bread. Right, because bread has gotten this um, kind of unfortunate uh, uh, people have the idea that that bread makes you fat yes they're, they're definitely there's definitely an element of that yeah. um, you know people are restricting themselves to two slices of, of baguette per meal and things like that yeah. whereas they might have had four 50 years ago yeah. um, but also, of course, people actually need less calories. And um, because so many people here um, eat out at lunch, uh, you know, because their work provides a canteen or um, they're eating in a restaurant or whatever, you're eating quite a lot of food. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that bread is an easy thing to ditch if you're wanting to reduce your calories. Yeah. And it, it doesn't look wasteful if you simply don't take yeah. you know, more than two slices. Whereas if you leave half of your plate of main course, 
um, you know, that's food waste. Mm -hmm. And food waste is a big issue here. People are very conscious of food waste yes. and very um, conscious of doing the right thing. Yes. Yes, very much so. But of course, this year, things have changed because of the pandemic. People yep. eat more at home. Yep. And uh, it's true that people are uh, buying. I mean, sometimes at the grocery store, it's uh, we ran out of flour and yeast uh, yes, at the grocery store too. because mm. um, because people were stocking up to yep. be able to make their own bread at home. Now, yep. most French people don't make their own bread at home. It's not no. it's not common because mm. <laughs> unless you live. If I had to get in the car to go get bread, mm. maybe I would have a bread machine yes. because yep. because it'd be nice to have, you know, mm. bread first thing in the morning, yep. uh, fresh bread first thing in the morning. But I, I'm so close. I just walk over there. You know, I'm 50 yep. meters away from the bakery. So exactly. I, I mean, we deliberately bought a house in a village because we we realized that getting in your car every morning to go to the bakery was a pain. Yeah. So we deliberately bought in a village so that we just, you know, walk down the street and yeah. get it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's one of the nice things about living in a village if it has a bakery because, like you mm. mentioned, a lot mm. of them mm. don't anymore because they're just mm. enough, there's not enough business for them to uh, draw a salary. Mm. Once they mm. get all their their costs, um. yep. so what's yep. your what's your favorite bread that you that you like to uh, that you like to to buy? Well, I generally um, buy tradition. Tradition. Okay. Um, I'm not mega um, uh, sort of adventurous. Um, <laughs> my husband is a big fan of tr old traditional bull. Yeah. So we have that sometimes as a treat for him. But since it's mostly me who goes out to the boulangerie, then, you know, he gets what <laughs> I buy. Um, uh, it's the opposite at our house. It's mostly my husband who goes to the bakery, to the boulangerie. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I do like, like multigrain breads and things like that, but I don't buy them very often. Mm -hmm. um, they are much more of a treat sort of a thing. So for everyday purposes, then it's the tradition all the way. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a type of bread that's kind of hard to find in France, and that's the, mm. the kind of uh, sandwich bread that Americans like. Uh, oh, yes. You know, Good like, old Harry's. Yeah, yeah, yes. Or, or, or actually uh, bagels is... It's pretty mm. hard to find. Big cities now have bagel places, but they'll charge mm. you, you know, four euros for a plain bagel. And I'm like, no, that's not happening. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so. that's, yes. I mean, certainly, I, I cannot imagine our local um, boulangerie making bagels. No. Um, so you won't find bagels. You won't find sandwich bread like what you're used to. Well, no, we have sandwich bread, obviously. Yep. But not yep. like... Um, like a Subway bread, you know, like for a Subway oh, sandwich. Oh, God. Just be thankful. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes a sandwich it's is sub nice. Subway. But <laughs> Subway is really disgusting. I'm sorry. But it's the sort of place that you walk past and you can smell it before you see it. Yes, they, um, they vent. And, and the... then you just go, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't mind these, these things, these places. I don't, you know, I'm... On, on occasion, I'm happy eating there, but mm. but if you want to make your own at home, you're not going to find a lot of that sort of soft bread, you know, because mm. uh, French people eat sandwiches in baguette. Yes, and mm. and a sandwich isn't proper food, of course. No, it's something you do just because mm. you know because you you're in a hurry or something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, what uh, what do you think people need to watch out for? Because you know, uh, a lot of my listeners are from the U.S., mm. and one of the f their favorite question to ask is, "What is the best boulangerie in Paris?" Uh, or it's some one that's closest to you. Ah, there you go. That would be my answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think that people's visitors. 
stress out in a way that a French person would never do. Um, now, for example, um, we used to have two boulangeries in, in our village um, and I used them both but for different things. Right. So, you know, I could go to one for bread and one for patisserie, for example. Um, and and that's what that's what most people will do. Yeah. And there's always going to be a good bakery within walking distance of you if you're in an urban area. So it might not literally be the one that's closest to you, but it's not something that you need to cross town for. Oh, thank you so much for saying that, because sometimes I feel like I'm preaching in the desert. Like, stop making lists of the 10 best bakeries in Paris, because people will actually go and spend a whole day or two or three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they zigzag all over. all over the place. Yes, and it's it makes so no sense. It makes no sense. Do not mm. go to Paris to try yep. somebody's idea of the 10 best bakeries in Paris. Yep. That's, no, I agree. That's just, just mm, stop it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have to just enjoy the bakery that's near you. And yep. and if you stay there long enough, eventually you will decide that, ah, yes, I like this product at this bakery and I like the same product better at a, a different product yep. better at a different bakery. But yep. that's only something you can you can ascertain once you've been there a while mm. for instance yep. for instance my my frequent co-host elise she mm. when she drives to my house to record the good old days when we could still record in person yeah she would often bring uh, croissant and mm. she would always stop at this one bakery and mm. you know she often said oh you're so lucky i just love the croissant from this bakery and this mm. is a bakery i never ever go to because mm. i don't like their bread and mm. it's it's the next village over so why would i you know i mean yep. <laughs> but but people have their favorites but yep. that's that's fine but if you're just visiting it's just silly to, yep. You know, you can't tell the difference anyway between uh, the bread from this bakery and the one from that bakery unless you're there long enough to start yep. noticing the, the subtle differences. Yep. So yep. I wouldn't worry about it and too much. From the point of view of, you know, me living in a small village, I am wise to develop a relationship with my local boulangerie because... You never know what comes out of that sort of a relationship. You know, if you are a regular customer, they're, they're open to doing all sorts of favours. And, yeah, so it's not worth my while yeah. to, I mean, it'd be absolutely crazy to drive to the next village um, to buy bread <laughs> when I've got a perfectly good boulangerie. Um, I mean, you know, I, I am lucky in that I like them personally and they make good bread and superb patisseries. Yeah. So, you know, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but even if the bread was only average, average I still in France wouldn't is pretty drive good. to the next village to right. buy right. bread that was better. Yeah, average in France is very good. So... Mm, exactly. We're running out of time, but I have to I have mm. to uh, re tell you this funny thing. My my husband likes to sing and he was in a choir. This is very early when we first moved to France. And in mm. this choir, they went on a tour, right? Mm. And they were touring little um villages uh not too far from Toulouse. And they were one of the concerts they were doing was in a place where one of the choristers had a house. So he, mm. he knew all the bakeries around. Yep. Mm. And there was a long conversation. And other people in the choir had visited these villages. And they had to converse at length uh, just to decide where they were going to go get <laughs> the bread for mm. uh, different meals, you know, because mm. that was really important because you don't want to mm. be stuck with the... With, um, the less desirable, whatever. But they had to go drive around because they were buying for 50 people for a big choir. Mm. So they had to place an order because that's another thing. If you, yes. you know, if your baker is used to producing for 
200 people and all of a sudden it's 250 people, well, yep. you might not have bread. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so it was funny that he's like, I can't imagine that a group of Americans would ever spend that much time discussing, you know, yep. what time do they close, what time do they yep. open, yep. who's driving by at the right time. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the bread um, will be dry by the uh, by the time we eat it. Oh no. <laughs> this this is reflected in how um, Americans sit down at a restaurant table as well and they pour over the menu and they discuss it at great length, whereas a French person will walk into a restaurant and go, ah, set menu, looks excellent, let's go with that. Exactly, you know, that's no, true, that's no a big difference. About it. Yeah. That's a big uh, difference, yes, and and yeah. Americans will want to discuss possible substitutions and yes. things like that, and in France, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> no, the the restaurateur knows what to do. They will bring yeah. you something good. The end. It, 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 exactly. It is about that respect for the artisan. That that the artisan knows what his ingredients in the kitchen are, knows how to prepare them, and wants the best for you, the consumer. And so you just roll with it. Yeah. Yeah. And and then almost always right. You know, taking the set menu is almost always the best option, both yes. food experience-wise and certainly price-wise. Yes, and also it will come out faster because they've rehearsed yep. how they bring yep. that out. They know they're going to do yep. that 50 times today, so they're yep. ready and to serve that. Yeah, exactly, and everyone around you is all having that as well. Yeah. And and in France, you know, it's all, it's all about what's in season. It's not them trying to get rid of some manky ingredient that's been in the fridge too long. No. It's about what they bought at the market. Yeah, yes, usually. Yesterday yes. or in the morning or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yes, because they have a set, uh, in carte, but, mm. but then it's whatever they found at the, at, you know, at the market that they will put mm. in their daily special. Mm. Le menu. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, uh, well, thank you so very much, uh, Susan. It's been a delight to talk to you. Again, your blog is Days on the Clez, and Clez is C-L-A-I-S-E. Yep. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much, Annie. Au revoir. Au revoir. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Join us with just one word. Thank you all for supporting the show. Some of you for many years now, you are wonderful. And a shout out this week to new patrons, David Whitehead, Lisa Henderson, Erica Davis, Poppy Winningham and Eleanor Haffer. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and making this podcast possible. And my thanks also to Sabatino Pulgini for sending in a one-time donation by using the green button on any page on joinusinfrance.com that says tip your guide. Sabatino wrote, thanks for doing such a great job. And I say thank you for your support. I've added you to the secret Facebook group. That way you'll get access to the videos. French tip of the week. This week I'm going to share a podcast recommendation for those of you who are quite advanced in French. Search for a podcast named Un Bonbon sur la Langue with Muriel Gilbert. Muriel is a correctrice for Le Monde, so her whole job is to hunt down spelling errors that French journalists make. I mess up spelling in French as easily as I do in English, so it's great to have her point out some of the common pitfalls that I should avoid. If your French is advanced, you will love her short bits on RTL Radio, Un bonbon sur la langue, which means candy on the tongue. She's great and she reminds me of a professor I had long, long ago when I did a two-year degree in journalism and public relations right out of high school. I had a professor who was the corrector for La Dépêche du Midi and I must confess that back then I did not have an appreciation for the work he was doing and the good word that he was preaching. I barely listened because, hey, the spell checker was brand new and that would do the trick, right? 
Wrong. <laughs> anyway, if you love the French language and want to go deep on common mistakes and why they happen, listen to Muriel Gilbert, Un bonbon sur la langue. This week in French news, the vaccination campaign is still going as slowly as molasses, as Elise would say. Just a little over 3% of French people have been vaccinated. That's against around 10% of Americans, so we're slow. The number of new infections is holding steady at around 20,000 per week. We're not out of the woods yet. Do not plan on visiting France in 2021. That's just my opinion. I don't have a crystal ball. Today is Chinese New Year, as well as the seventh anniversary of the podcast. I'm recording this a couple days before you hear it. This warrants a celebration, doesn't it? So I will do my best at uh, making some Chinese food tonight at home, but I must confess that I'm not great in that department. Sometimes I get lucky, but, but I'm never sure if it'll be comparable to what we can get at Chinese restaurants in France. Not that it's all that authentic, probably, but it's what we're used to, you know. And how do you celebrate a podcast anniversary? I'd like to take Elise to lunch, but we can't do that today, so I'll just talk to her on the phone. At the suggestion of a friend of mine, Sherry, on the Facebook group, I'm brushing up on my brique recipe and technique. She reminded me that I made it for her years ago, back when I was studying communications. <laughs> and she still remembers it. Brique, it's spelled B-R-I-C-K, is a spe specialty from North Africa. You'll find it attributed to Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, etc. I used to make it all the time and then I forgot about it, but probably because it takes a little bit of time and I it didn't stay on my normal rotation for very long because I was too busy. But it's delicious. So I made some yesterday. I'm clearly out of practice folding those things. <laughs> so I have to make some more this week. It's a fried or baked phyllo dough filled with something yummy. And usually it's tuna fish, chopped boiled eggs, and good seasonings. Then you fold it into a triangle, you spray oil on it, and you bake it. That's how I make it. But you could also deep fry it. It tastes better if you deep fry it, I'm sure. But I need to stay away from fried foods. So if I manage to fold some correctly, <laughs> next time I try them, I'll post photos on Facebook. This week, I'm listening to a book in French by popular French historian Max Gallo. He's big enough as a French author to have his books translated into English, which is really rare these days. So I'll put a link to it in the show notes and on the boutique. Napoleon died 200 years ago, and we're still talking about him because he really changed France. The book is called The Sun of Austerlitz, or Le Soleil d'Austerlitz in French, and I'm really enjoying it. It's not, you know, your super duper page turner, you know, suspense novel or anything, but if you like history, I think you'll like it. I'm thinking I should prepare an episode about Napoleon to be released the week of this anniversary. That's going to be the... F I think he died on the 5th of May, 200 years ago. I think so. If you love Napoleon and you want to talk about him with me, shoot me an email, annie at joinusinfrance.com, and uh, we'll get that prepared. And speaking of that, several of you have responded to my request for new trip reports. I have a few recordings lined up, including one that I'm going to do later today. That is wonderful. The door is still open if you have something about France that's near and dear to you. And if you're cooking something special from Join Us at the Table... Post it on social media and tag me so I can see it. I love that so many of you have been taking pictures of your food creations in your homes with a book in the background. It's a wonderful feeling. And I'm so glad that uh, we're all taking the time to cook good food at home. Keep cooking at home. When this pandemic is over, let's all eat out at every meal. <laughs> I must admit, I miss eating out. Not that I did it that often in the past, but it was fun. You know, France is not like America with a takeout place at every corner. Um, where I live, it's actually pretty uh, difficult to find takeout. Like for tonight, I was thinking, oh, we'll, we can do takeout Chinese food, but we have the 
um, the curfew that annoys everybody. So everybody has to be home by six. I'm not going to buy takeout at five and eat it by done eating. No, no, that's not going to work. Anyway, so yes, these are the joys of the pandemic. So somebody last week who was listening to the episode mentioned that I should look for uh, things that are made for the GoPro to go on the bike. And she was right. She was right. Thank you so much. I ordered one, got it right away. Unfortunately, it's raining cats and dogs today, so I can't, I'm not trying it on my husband's bicycle, (laughs) but I'll, I'll try that very soon. If you enjoy the show, introduce a friend to the podcast and show them how to listen. We're on all the podcast apps, podcast places, and you can ask your smart speaker to play Join Us in France. Next week on the podcast, an episode with Elise about Brunichel. Brunichel, B-R-U-N-I-Q-U-E-L. See, all these people are posting articles about off the beaten track in France and everything they list is totally on everybody else's list. Now, I can tell you for sure that Brunichel is on nobody else's list (laughs) because it's not very big and it's, you know, lots of people know about it, but not that many, really. So send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France travel podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2021 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. (laughs) 